All right, next up is, uh, this was a long shot ask for me, believe it or not. Uh, I said, there's no way she would ever say yes. Uh, but I reached out and she said yes. And that's just the wonderful part about doing this. I have yet to find a speaker invite after all these months since, gosh, 2020. We've had over 100 speakers come through this party from all over the state and sometimes out of the state. Not a single no. Can you believe it? So this one is Lee Turner. I've gotten to know her just by watching politics, uh, being friends with her online, see, seeing her videos on Facebook. She is a former candidate for U.S. Congress. Everybody, please extend a warm Greenwood welcome to Lee Turner. Hey everybody, my name is Lee Turner. I call myself Jane of all trades and queen of fix it. Don't just change it, fix it. <laughs> I, unlike the, uh, the little bio that uh, Bill put on the announcement of the meeting, I do not actually hail from uh, Greenville. Um, I'm an army brat, so I'm from everywhere and nowhere. <laughs> my dad retired in uh, 1970 in Elberton, Georgia, right over the border and started the ROTC program in the high school there. So he was the colonel for uh, 20 years after he wore the, the uh, uniform. Uh, a lot of my girlfriends tell me I've had such an interesting life, I need to write a book. I finally decided what I was gonna name it. I'm gonna call it, and then I met this guy. <laughs> <laughs> so I graduated uh, from uh, Elbert County High School in 1972 and uh, Went, uh, went my first couple of years to North Georgia College in Dahlonega, Georgia, and then finished at uh, UGA, Go Dogs, Wolf Wolf. <laughs> and, um, but having moved from uh, Heidelberg, Germany to Elberton, Georgia, I was like, why am I here and when can I leave? <laughs> so <laughs> I, uh, after I got an accounting degree from UGA, I became an auditor with uh, Pricewaterhouse, now Pricewaterhouse Coopers, um, in Atlanta and uh, went with some guy up in Virginia somewhere, worked for a coal company, then came back to Atlanta and ended up, um, as luck would have it, uh, going to work for Turner Broadcasting in 1980, right when CNN went on the air. So yes, it was an interesting, I was there for six years, and the first three years I was in the corporate financial group, and the last three, I was part of the little ragtag group that when Ted uh, Turner woke up one morning and decided he wanted CNN in every hotel room and airport around the world, our little group, did that. And uh, so as a result, I've, been, I've had the privilege of watching uh, Rupert Murdoch since the 1980s when we all agreed he was a sleazy yellow journalist who'd say anything and do anything to sell something. So you can imagine my horror over all these years that I, I watch him buy this and buy that. I was about to die when he bought the um, Wall Street Journal. But nonetheless, um, other than having gone a lot of places and done a lot of things, I was a reasonably normal person until um, a fateful day in April of 2017 when Steve Mnuchin stood up and waved that one page of tax reform. At that moment in time, I was uh, applying my trade as a tax professional and doing tax returns for wealthy people. So I knew those first four subjects were major tax giveaways to the wealthy, and I decided they had just pissed off the wrong woman. <laughs> I was brand new in South Carolina. I lived out in Powdersville, um, a suburb of Greenville, did tax returns in my dining room, and didn't know a soul. Had never, I'd always voted, uh, tended to always vote uh, Democrat as, as Bill, but that had been the extent of it. But. Uh, that tax reform and knowing how bad it was just set me on fire. So I put one foot in front of the other and uh, you know, put my boots up. First of all, I spun off a Facebook page and started uh, writing. And any candidates that use social media, um, if you'll do the kind where you can, you know, you have to spend money to boost posts, but that's what I did. And I could get the analytics on who was reading the stuff that I was putting on there. And so I realized when I just wrote something, it skewed older and more towards women. 
uh, when I put a cute picture of me on there, the younger the better, it skewed more heavily towards men. And then when I started standing out on the street and doing the videos that Bill's referring to, it skewed young men. I mean, it told me there's a big difference in how you go about things. I also, more than anything, realized at that point in time that people were too mad to talk to each other. I said, there has got to be a way we can bring people to the table to sit down and talk to each other. And I decreed on my page, I said, we will not call names. We will not even mention names unless they're pertinent to the subject involved. We're not going to mention parties. We're not going to throw rocks. We're going to talk about the issue, the solution, and how we can get there. With my having a, a math uh, background, I said, you know, you can take any problem there is, a problem that the other side might consider a social issue or a giveaway to the poor issue, you know, something they uh, relate with us, and you can turn it into a math problem that shows fixing that problem drops money to the bottom line. So my whole ploy when I went out was, you know, everybody's got to have a little gimmick, right? And my way to stay on track and talk about the issues I knew were everyone's issues and we might get somewhere with, if somebody wanted to talk about, well, for instance, a guy, I'm part of a group that gets out on Main Street in, every Tuesday in Greenville. We call ourselves Tell Them Tuesday. We've been out there every Tuesday for over five years. And uh, they call me the Republican whisperer in the group. So if somebody crazy comes up, they send them over to me. And uh, <laughs> so this guy came up one day just ranting and raving about locking up Hillary. And yeah, I knew I didn't want to talk to him about locking up Hillary. But what I said to him was, my friend, I know a lot of people think Hillary should be locked up. I know that's true. So it sounded like I was agreeing with him when really I wasn't. I said, but here's my deal. I got two buckets. One bucket builds GDP for America, and the other bucket is luxury America can't afford. It doesn't mean it's bad, it doesn't mean we won't do it later, but we're not gonna do it now, and I'm gonna focus on this bucket right here. So you can start talking about taxes, you can start talking about health care. you can start talking about livable wage, you can start talking about education. The way we are going to win is not talking about the issues we wanna talk about. I hate to tell y'all, we're not going to win races talking about trans issues, talking about reparation, talking about the things that they equate to nothing but weird socialist giveaway, la di da. We're going to win the race by talking about the issues they want to talk about health care, liberal wages, education, you know, that sort of thing. And you can use the ploy of like, you know, yes, I know you want to talk about, but let's talk about this. Or for instance, if they want to talk about guns, you say, sir, I understand that you have a right to have a gun and I have a right to not be shot by your gun. So I'm sure somewhere in the middle, we can find a meeting of the minds that, you know, we can all live with. If they want to talk about abortion, you say, I say, we all want the same thing. We all want fewer abortions. You come at it from one way and I come at it from another, but we all want the same thing. And then you go on and talk about health care or minimum wage or, or liberal wage rather. But it's important for us in South Carolina in the distinct minority for us to be realistic about what it takes to win a race. And when you take an issue, lay out the pros and cons, turn it into math, they say, gee, she sounds reasonable. I might listen to her. So, you know, we need to keep those things in mind. We're all so fervent about the issues that are important to us. But we need to focus on what's important to them because there are not enough Democrats in this state to elect Democratic candidates. Not at the moment anyway. But that brings to mind, you know, life is a war and you fight the war on a lot of fronts. So in the political arena, you fight it by candidates to run, so they're out there with their message. You fight it by having that uh, troop of people who are religious about voter registration, voter registration, voter registration. You know, that's what's going to turn us into Georgia. We're 10 years behind Georgia, but that's why they got where they got. 
you know, get the people out, get the people out, because those people are out there. If you listen to the numbers that Brandon Upson talks about in the Democratic Black Caucus, those people are out there. But finally, we need people like me who don't want to run, don't want a job, don't want to be famous to be pounding the message. You know, lay it out, and, and I told Bill I don't have any fancy you know, PowerPoints and this and that, because I'm used to doing my stuff out on the street, and I have a piece of poster board with things on it. And it's amazing how much attention you can get by talking common sense and make, when you take an issue and make it simple so people can understand, it gives them hope. And when they have hope, they will go vote. We need to, the candidates, do not hang out with Democrats. They're already gonna vote for you. So unless they're writing you a check, do not hang out with them. You know, go find the Republicans. Go take a message that you never mention party, you know, never mention names, and talk about issues, math, 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 beat them to death, and say, look, we did this and we dropped money to the bottom line. We've got to stop eating our own. We've got to stop with the cancel culture and political purity tests, because that's a, a sure way to um, defeat, uh, get defeated as well. So I think that's pretty much all I've got to say. I want to encourage everyone, if I can run, anyone can run. You know, I didn't know one soul, not one soul, in my whole district. And we ended up having the most highly contested congressional race in history at any time, anywhere, because Trey Gowdy got out. And I had four Democratic opponents, all established, all had more money, all had more re name recognition. But in the primary, I beat all the boys. So, and I was scared to death to get up in front of, uh, and talk to anybody, and you can see I'm not now. You know, that was the biggest gift I got. So we need to have people running. We need to have independent people out there with a message for everyone, and we need to have people registering voters, and to do that, you have to go where they are. You cannot set up in a community center, even if you give away free chili dogs, and expect them to come to you because they will not. All right, thank you, Lee. Round of applause, that was incredible. Oh, you don't get to leave yet. I hope you can see why I invited her to come down and speak. She is incredible, and I think we would have been very well served had she won that election. Uh, just to clarify about the election, and this is the importance of the primary. Uh, Lee had multiple opponents in the Democratic Party for that primary, and she came out on top. Well, but I didn't, I, I, okay. Yeah. I, I won the primary, but I didn't win the. Yeah, she came out on top, but not by enough. So it went into, what do they call it? We have to do it again? Runoff. A runoff yeah. a couple of weeks later. So it's important, during, and during the runoff, something went upside down there if you want to expand no, on that. No, note to self, um, if you're in a contested race, come in second, don't come in first. Because if you come in first, your people think you either you won or you're gonna win anyway, so they don't come back. So my opponent did a great job of getting all of his voters to come back. And my voters basically, like I said, they either thought I had won, um, they thought I would win, or they went on vacation. It was summertime and they went on vacation, so. Yeah, politics is a funny thing where sometimes you get the most votes and you don't end up winning. How about that? Any questions for Lee before we let her go? Lee, Gary. Oh, one, please, one away from the microphone. Gary Burgess, thank you for being here. I'm running for State Superintendent of Ed. Here's a question, and I thank uh, the chair for doing this. I am in black rather than blue as a Democrat on this because I ran as Republican, but I found my right mind and I came back to my father's uh, party. What advice would you give for to me, because I'm running against two establishment uh, Democrats uh, for the office of state superintendent of education? And I've been told by Democrats, I'm glad you said what you said, not to hang out with Republicans, but I've been hanging out with Republicans because I think everybody wants to educate kids and take education back from the extreme left and the extreme right. You know, going through a primary um, is tough because you sort of operate on one set of rules on the front side of the primary and a different set on the back side. Um, and that's what I realized that once I got through the primary, I said, gee, all those um, endorsements we were uh, 
soliciting and hope we would get during the primary, those things hurt you when you get to the other side and you're running against the uh, Republicans. So, you know, my advice to anyone running in a primary situation, um, and it's, it's, it is different from, you know, what I said otherwise, but um, I'm trying to think what I was going to say. Um, you, have to, you have to stand out. You have to figure out a way to stand out. We have a um, race in District 25 in, in Greenville where I live, Leela Robinson Simpson, who's been our state house rep for years, is retiring. So we have five people running in that race. And I saw four of them speak the other night, and they were all well qualified, you know, la di da but they got out there and it was blah, 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 blah. You know, they were all exactly the same. Nobody stood out. So, you know, you have to have something that makes you different from your opponents when you're in the, you know, primary situation. And then once you get to the other side uh, and, you ha and you're the Democrat op opposing a Republican, you do it slightly differently. And that's when you start hanging out with uh, Republicans. While you're still in the primary side, yeah, because you need the votes, you're competing for the votes among the Democrats. But once you're the nominee, um, quit hanging out with Democrats. Next question. Well, my name's Mary Hill. I'm from Abbeville, and I'm pleased to meet you, Ms. Turner. But I had a, a little thing I wanted to tell you, too. Um, number one mistake Democrats are making right now in the education field is the, um, the same mistake Virginia made, the Virginia governor made, that parents, you know, aren't educated or they don't matter. I think you should say parents matter, but remember, teachers are parents, too. Okay? And teachers right now in the state of South Carolina are very, very, um, I don't know, I don't want to say disgruntled, but that's not the right word. I'm, they're just the, the, um, they're underappreciated. And the mood for teachers right now is very low because they feel like that they think, the parents think they're teaching CRT, or critical race theory. And, and that just does not exist in the school. It's called history, people. History. So that's the one thing I would say. And um, you need to win the culture wars if you're going to beat the Republicans. And the one thing you can do is just disarm them on the culture wars. When you, you, when you say something your adversary doesn't expect, it yes. totally disarms them. You know, my thing with education, and I don't have children, so I don't have the same level of understanding that you guys do, but I know the importance of a good teacher. And, you know, I say we have it all backwards. The teachers of America should be the rock stars, should be the superstars. They should be the highest paid people. You know, we need to think back to the Asian culture and the ancient cultures where the, the teachers and the gurus, they were, they were the rock stars. And the way you get the best people in an industry is to pay them. Thank you. Great point. Final question here. Hello. Could you tell us a little bit about counterculture and what that exactly means? Because I'm very confused. I Can see cancel culture. Cancel, cancel culture. culture. Basically, it means, and it's kind of related to political purity, too. You take one misstep and the rest of the Democrats are ready to cut your head off. Um, I would go into my personal uh, story with it, but I'd rather not. <laughs> um, but I experienced it firsthand from having been a former uh, a congressional candidate and um, Kurt at that point in time being the president of the Democratic Women of Greenville County. So where does it originate? With the left, the right, the middle? The, the left, the left. And what I saw in my particular situation, it was like the young people fighting the old people. And um, it's the same thing that happened with um, Al Franken where everybody jumped the gun and said he's got to go. Um, and you know, that situation had more layers to it. But there, what happened in, in 2020 when we had 23 presidential candidates coming through South Carolina, a lot of people got into the politics business. And a lot of those people are ambitious. They, not, not so much running for office necessarily, but uh, running through the ranks in, as far as being employed in the political arena. There could be a lot of that too, but what? 
What I have seen personally is not that. It's people that I know um, that start attacking others. We have too many people out there trying to make names for themselves by stepping on other people. So, and that's one reason I'm just up here speaking as a concerned citizen and not trying to. They already started the negative uh, ads on television. I don't know if South Carolina was a visit. Uh, guy from North Carolina, Bill Turner or something, they've already started Biden's ruined us. We are going down the chimney and we're going to go down the chimney with this right cause uh, and I'll be here to, and so we've got to get out there. I have a feeling we're going to need Ken to be a speaker at one of our meetings. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's got some good points and a lot on his mind. All right, thank you very much, Lee. I'm about to bowl you over. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, this is what it's all about. Uh, Lee, your words couldn't be more timely, and I'm very appreciative, and I was back there taking some notes. You said some good things that hit home. Uh, and thank you also for all the questions uh, and the comments and, and, and you know, just even the members bring a lot to the table. So thank you for attending and asking.